Hello, everyone. I'm super excited that everyone is coming from such different places. And uh, yeah, today we're going to speak about rendering optimization. And this is part, this event, this webinar is part of our open lecture series where we are inviting um, amazing XR experts and developers to share more about their knowledge. And um, yeah, you can also check out our XR Bootcamp YouTube channel where you can basically um, watch the recordings. But the huge advantage you are having actually by attending live is that you are able to ask your own questions and also get the answers. And we are definitely looking to answer all of the questions asked. So um, yeah, feel free. <laughs> and um, yeah, now I'm going to speak a little bit more about XR Bootcamp before we are starting with Ruben Torres, the game dev guru, um, with his presentation. Um, yeah, XR Bootcamp. Um, we have different um, characteristics, which we're really proud of. That is, um, and I just want to go over a few of these points that we are really a big community. And um, right now I would like to extend this invitation to all of you to join our XR Creators Discord channel. Um, we are also going to share the link to the XR Creators Discord channel in the chat here. And uh, yeah, we're already a lot of people there discussing and asking questions and getting answers and networking. And it's definitely worth going there. And yeah, in terms of our classes, we have different master classes. Right now, it's really focused on advanced level master class classes. Um, from advanced VR interactions to rendering to dots. Um, so, if you're interested in learning more, feel free to check them out. And all of them are portfolio project focused. So, in the end, you're going to have portfolio projects that you can share with future employers um, that are definitely going to be useful later on. And um, it's really taught by um, yeah, the, the, the most advanced people from the industry. And um, um, the result of all of that is that our students, our graduates are always very happy. Even if they have worked a lot with Unity beforehand, uh, they are always going to learn something new and really becoming masters of, um, of the XR skill sets. And yeah, usually a lot of big companies are joining our classes. Um, and especially as a developer, you can also benefit from the network you're gaining. And um, yeah, so we are very proud of that. And of course, we are Unity Authorized uh, Training Partner. Yeah, we have, um, I would like to actually hand over now. I mean, these are all our classes that we are offering at Exa Bootcamp, a quick overview. Um, yeah, I mean, we don't, want, we don't want to go into detail. It's just like for you to, to, to see. Maybe, Ferhan, you want to say a few more words about the Rendering Optimization Masterclass? Yeah, thank you, Rahel. Uh, as usual, we, we are uh, quite crowded here today. So, uh, yeah, as Rahel mentioned, we have uh, various um, kinds of masterclasses and boot camps. Some of them are directly related with um, be, uh, for beginners and the others are advanced. Today, our uh, webinar and like workshop is uh, a little bit for um, people who are already Unity developers. So I will just go through our advanced programs, which might be interesting for you. So um, we have three major uh, programs based on standalone XR headsets. We believe that this is the future. So all our programs, especially advanced programs are helping you to um, get the best out of uh, standalone XR headsets. Uh, first one is the uh, interactions, which is the advanced VR interactions. Uh, the second one, random optimization, which we will talk a lot today. Um, so our workshop is actually a first step towards the masterclass. And the third one is uh, DOTS ECS. Uh, it's a new uh, programming paradigm for from Unity. If you have... Um, hundreds of objects and entities in a scene. Uh, this is probably for standalone, especially or mobile devices, it's probably the, um, the future for, for programming in a, a most performant way for the software architecture. And uh, yeah, maybe a little bit more about the advanced VR interactions and hand tracking. We have uh, always, always great uh, selected individuals for these master classes. Actually, this program just started this week. We we just come from the one of the live sessions um, like a few minutes ago. It's quite a um, um, diverse group of individuals from um, different organizations. This, this cohort, we are hosting developers and designers from um, Carnegie Mellon University, Harvard, 
Autodesk, HP, Deloitte, Unity Studio. So this is really something that we really would like to um, um, provide, bringing the top individuals who are working on VR AR development together and help them share um, uh, in addition to our trainers, of course. So we really would like to keep this cohort-based format for our other advanced classes. So um, the other class is DOTS. We know that DOTS is uh, still in uh, progress from Unity side, but there are lots of things to learn and it takes time to learn. So we want to make everyone uh, actually be aware of uh, what are the possibilities with DOTS. And um, we want to actually create uh, some kind of like an awareness, but also um, inform people, Unity developers who are already interested on uh, developing their next game or app in DOTS. So we create this um, uh, again, another workshop, which is happening in almost um, two, three weeks, 6th of May. We are inviting all of you. This is also a free, free uh, a workshop. And uh, this will be also um, a first step towards our DOTS masterclass, which we are hoping to start this summer. So um, if you are interested, feel free to uh, join the class uh, or the workshop. Our team will also share the DOTS workshop um, uh, link, Eventbrite link, so you can register. So rendering optimization. Yes, we have, I mean, uh, I don't know how many of us here already um, um, multiple year uh, Unity developer, but optimization, let's admit, optimization and performance issues are always um, something important before you deliver your product. And we want to help on that, especially if you are building um, on a standalone XR headset. So we created six weeks program with Ruben, and we are quite excited because today we will uh, share the a little bit of uh, sneak peek of this program. Um, the first week is uh, like the pipeline. Second week is much more we are focusing on the porting side. And third week, um, uh, lighting. Uh, fourth week is much more on the asset and interface. There are, of course, more details. I, I don't want to go so much detail because we will already talk a little bit of that. But the last two weeks, is uh, maybe something to worth to mention. Uh, we want to help you to actually utilize and use the techniques that you already know before coming to the class, plus the techniques that you will learn in the class and help you to actually implement this uh, with, the, with the supervision of our trainers and mentors. So we will give you a great, actually good looking scene uh, running on a quest. So this, this scene will be provided to you. Um, and we expect you to um, actually work on this scene. But there is a one problem. Uh, this scene is running at five frames per second. So we expect you to at least bring it to a level that at least quest one uh, that's applicable for quest one, which is 72 frames per second. And we will be happy to answer any questions regarding this, um, uh, this nightmare scenario as well uh, after we have the Q&A session. Um, uh, and after that, maybe uh, for the next slide, I can also recommend that you check the optimization checklist that is also free uh, on our website. You can also, uh, probably our team will also share the link of this checklist. And uh, we have also one more um, announcement yeah, for um, for the for this um, uh, webinar, we are also providing ten percent discount for all our uh, advanced master classes till tomorrow, end of tomorrow. So if you are interested, please feel free to apply. Um, yeah, I think uh, right now uh, I would like to invite Ruben. Uh, he will he will tell about a little bit of maybe introduction of the of this workshop and then we have actually a hands-on um, uh, recording for you that we will go through it and then there will be q a hi ruben how are you hey all good thanks Ferhan. so Let's today my screen yeah today we have also a great number of audience from uh, various regions so um i hope that we will 
answer as many questions as possible and we will give you an at least an overview of uh, this optimization framework so uh, you can share your screen ruben okay um, let me know if you see the screen perfect works well right all right so my name is ruben i think ferhan already introduced me I'm uh, the guy behind the, the game dev.guru, basically the place where you know I post a lot of content on optimization for games and applications. So welcome to this webinar. I think Ferhan already said that a few times, but nevertheless, welcome again. I'm super happy to be here and give a short presentation for you. So what is going on in the industry? This is the first question that I would like to start this uh, presentation with. Of course, when I ask this, I mean, what is going on in the industry of games and applications related, you know, in the area of performance? You know, if I was a developer and I was just, you know, developing for Quest, I could just be surfing the internet and come across an, some article like this. I'm just going to read this a bit aloud. Okay, so Quest 2 hardware is already pushed pretty hard by 90 hertz speed. This is why many Quest 2 games stick to the lowest 72 FPS. Hmm. If I read this, I will be like, okay, very interesting. Next article, I don't care about this one. Next one. Okay, so performance heavy applications or games just want to be capable of running at 120 FPS. However, this 120 FPS might become a standard feature in future releases. Now I start to get worried because I am a Quest developer and something, someone is telling me that something is pretty complicated to do, right? So, you know, still, I don't want to give in. I just, you know, I, I just closed this website. I don't like it at all. So let me just go to another website and continue reading some news on, on Oculus Quest. The next one, 120 FPS or Hertz translates to 120 FPS. Okay, that I knew, no news. An extremely difficult to achieve performance metric that even good gaming PCs will struggle with. Okay, so if I was just a normal developer and I had no experience with performance optimization, this is the moment where I would start, you know, getting a bit uncomfortable with this news, right? The reason is, if 72 FPS is hard to reach, 120 FPS is hell, okay? So here we are talking about 80 milliseconds. And just for you to have a, an idea on this, just the baseline rendering takes about three milliseconds. And this doesn't give you much room at all for anything, okay? So this is becoming more and more important. So the question is, is there any hope left for developers who are not experienced in performance optimization? And the answer is obviously yes, because I'm here for a webinar and I'm here to talk about my book. That's of course just an expression. So what you need to do is to follow an structured optimization process, okay? One that just works. One that tells you at any point of your optimization journey, what the best next step is, okay? You need one framework that helps you go from zero to 72 FPS, from 72 to 90, from 90 to 120 and beyond. Because this is actually the trend. You see these monitors coming up with 120 uh, Hertz and then 144 and then 240 Hertz. In fact, I myself have one that runs at 240 hertz. And this is not only computers, right? This is also Android devices. You see that Android devices sometimes are also coming with uh, screens that support up to 120 hertz. And now, surprise, Quest 2 also supports 120 FPS. So the trend is surely there. And this is going to put a lot of extra work on us as developers. It's going to be quite difficult. So. We need an optimization, and this is the place where I come here to talk about my book. Don't mind the branding. You just need a process, okay? You just need an algorithm. Basically, you need to give it an input. For example, this could be your profiling information, your profiling metrics and data. 
Then you run a process. In this case, this would be the P3 optimization framework, which is uh, something that we are about to see. And the desired output is, of course, a high performing experience. All right. So let's just keep it short because I heard that some people don't like theory. My, I myself don't like it. This is the only slide that I would like to show before going into the video itself. First thing that you want to do is to define your performance targets. And I put three S there on purpose. I know how to spell. The reason I put three S's there is because there, are, there is much more than the framework. You also have the loading times. You also have the APK size. You also have the battery drain. You have many other things that are important when it comes to performance. But yes, indeed, frame rate is the one that is more uh, important, right? Then what you need to do is to iterate several times over the P3 optimization loop. This is about following three steps. First is profile. In the profile phase, you just need to gather intel. You need to gather data and metrics that helps you make a decision. Now comes the second step of this loop. This is the plan phase. Now with this information at hand, what you need to do is to investigate your options. And once you have options, I would normally suggest at least three options, then you need to rate them, then you need to weight them against four metrics, okay? Once you have all of this information, then you just need to perform the optimization. You just execute the best step towards, you know, Maybe you cannot reach 70, 72 FPS within one loop, but maybe you can reach it within three loops. So if you iterate over this P3 optimization loop, at the end, there is no other way around. You will just land at your target FPS. Of course, this is a super simplified view on this framework. There is still some sub steps in each of these uh, steps, but yeah, I don't have all the time in the world to explain all of, all of this. The last thing is, once you have shaped the game, you should do a performance retrospective. This is because you want to avoid the same mistakes, right? You want to create that do's and to do, sorry, a do's and don'ts uh, list so that people or even yourself don't make the same mistakes in the future. And you can do this only when you have learned through this process. There's another slide that I shouldn't have, have put because I promised that I would keep this short. So what I'm going to do now is to just show you a video because I didn't want really to risk Unity crashing or running out of battery in my quest. And I wanted to edit it in a way that it fits within the format of this webinar. So, But uh, one thing that I would like to uh, also yeah, uh, inform is um, please feel free to submit your questions in, not in the chat, but in the Q&A part because we are also following it and some of them maybe we can answer by text but some of them we will definitely answer in the q a part so we will be here uh, the but the hands-on part is very important for uh, for everyone here i guess to understand the framework in a better way uh, so uh, yeah we can start the uh, hands-on part now <clears throat> togo it's all yours All right, let's see what we have here for optimization in Unity. Does this sound familiar to you? Well, if it doesn't, then I still have spoiled it. You can probably see the title of this project. This is a project called 3D Beginner by Unity. Obviously, this is not a project that was intended for VR, let alone mobile, so we can kind of expect this not to perform so well, okay? But nevertheless, what should we start with? You know, just deploy to Quest and uh, let's see how it goes, I would say. All right, let's see how this looks like. Okay, this is nice, 72 FPS. So let, what's this? Oh, crap. Oh, Oof. You don't really want to see this, man. Okay, we're about 20 FPS if I just turned around. That's not good. Like, I feel already super dizzy. Don't trust me? Here, have a look. By the way, don't try this at home, okay? It's quite dangerous. So.
You see that? 20 FPS. Oof. She doesn't want to do this at home, okay? Not really. Neither playing at 20 FPS or putting the headset into the webcam. So you saw these numbers just a second ago, right? Like the frame rate and such. These numbers are coming from a tool called OVR metrics. And sadly, this OVR metrics tool is not displayed anytime that you stream through the Oculus developer dashboard, like here, okay? You have the streaming option and uh, sadly it doesn't show, but it shows on the device. And that's what you saw, okay? You saw the numbers and you saw that if I turned my back and stopped facing the wall, 20 FPS is not good, okay? You're just going to make everyone sick. So the first step here in the P3 optimization framework was that you have identified that you are not reaching your performance goals. In our case, it is Quest, so it could be about 72 FPS. Once you know that you are not there, what we are going to do is to execute several iterations on the P3 optimization loop. If you remember from the presentation, there are three steps in this loop. One is profile, then plan and then perform, but we are going to focus right now on profile. We know that we are not reaching 72 FPS, which is our performance goal. Actually, we are rather far away from that. We are at about 20 FPS. So I wonder what is going on. And I guess that you wonder that as well. So the first thing we are going to do is to profile and see what is happening. How do we do this? With tools. Now we have over 10 tools that we could use to see what is going on. But one of my favorite ones is the Unity Profiler, also OVR metrics, and we might as well need the frame debugger, okay? But for the sake of being fast for this presentation, we are just going to start with the Unity Profiler. So for this, you have to press Control 7 on the editor or Command 7 if you are on Mac. Then you need to attach to the player to your Quest device, uh, it's normally called auto-connected player. Make sure that you are recording and just put the headset on again and don't look, like just close your eyes if you are at 20 FPS, otherwise you're going to feel very sick. Now, it might not work because Oculus developer hub might be still in the ADB server instance. If that is the case, just try again, okay? Just clear the errors and then go to under player. Let's see if it works now. Maybe we can just select the other Oculus Quest. There it is. So here I am facing the wall. Okay, so it's looking good. Now, as soon as I turn around to see the main contents of the scene, just be careful and watch what's going to happen. Okay, now that we have this capture, what we're going to do is to analyze the numbers, all right? So here we can see that indeed there is a period in which we are below 30 FPS. Let's see what is happening here. You can do this several ways. The way I like to do this is by using the timeline itself. So let's see what the CPU is doing here. Okay, so basically we have our main thread and we are spending about 40 milliseconds in rendering. You see that? This is in general way too much for rendering. If you attack it in Quest, you always want to be top six milliseconds in rendering when it comes at least to the main thread. So 40 is definitely not good. We could as well inspect the render thread, but we are going to see something quite similar, right? Taking way too much time. Now, you have to ask yourself first, if you see this, where is this button leg coming from? We're talking here about the CPU, right? And the CPU is being very busy. You see, we cannot find any label saying something like waiting for GPU or similar. We see the CPU doing actual work. You see these green blocks? This means that the CPU has quite some work to do. Can you guess why is this the case? Well, if we run this scene in the editor, we can open the stats panel 
And here you will see a few numbers that we need to examine, right? We see patches about 2000, triangles about 3 million, and blah, blah, blah. Um, we have we have seen the chat that some of you I think uh, is seeing blurry. So we are now uh, continuing the video recording with the uh, while turning off the optimization part. So as you clearly see, Zoom also needs optimization like uh, Quest. So I hope now it will look good. So we will continue the video now. Top six milliseconds in rendering when it comes at least to the main thread. So 40 is definitely not good. We could as well inspect the render thread, but we are going to see something quite similar, right? Taking way too much time. Now, you have to ask yourself first, if you see this, where is this button lag coming from? We're talking here about the CPU, right? And the CPU is being very busy. You see, we cannot find any label saying something like waiting for GPU or similar. We see the CPU doing actual work. You see these green blocks? This means that the CPU has quite some work to do. Can you guess why is this the case? Well, if we run this scene in the editor, we can open the stats panel and here you will see a few numbers that we need to examine, right? We see patches about 2000, triangles about 3 million and blah, blah, blah. The rest is not that critical. So if you have some experience developing for Quest, you will instantly know that we are way above our budget regarding batches and triangles. Batches is just another word for draw calls, okay? And draw calls is just the way that your CPU has to tell the GPU to render something. So basically we are just rendering too many objects, okay? Basically this is the way that we can simplify the explanation for now. So this number that you see here, 2000, is above our budget. Do you know what our budget is for Quest? About 200. So this is 10 times above this number. This explains why if you go to the profiler, you will see that we are spending way too many milliseconds on the rendering side. And if we go to the wall, you know, this is not the case. We can say that in the rendering section, when we are looking at the wall, we have 20 draw calls. And when we are not, we have about actually 5K, right? So it is even worse on mobile. So the question is, why do we have so many draw calls and what can we do about that? Does it make sense? Remember, we are still in the profile phase. So we are just gathering intel. We are just gathering information that will let us decide later on, okay? So what other type of information do we need? We need to know what is happening with the batches, what is happening with the draw calls. And for this, we have a very juicy tool that is called the Frame Debugger. Just go to Window, Rendering, and oh, not Rendering, Analysis, and uh, Frame Debugger, okay? So here, you can just click Enable. Don't do this on Quest uh, for now, just do this on the editor. It's not going to be one-to-one -one the same, but this is going to be much faster for you to examine. If you want it to be super accurate, just do it on your target device, but for a first and brief look, you don't have to do this. Just click Enable, and of course, click on the game, and of course, click on the game tab because Unity decides for some reason that it's nice to troll you and switch back to the scene view. So here we are going to see the composition of our draw calls. We see that most of our draw calls are coming from the opaque geometry. And here we see that 300 of them are coming from shadows. So that's very good information to write down. Yes, you need to write down in the profile phase. You can do that somewhere, wherever you want, right? You can do that in the notepad, in a physical one. In your hand, it is up to you. We just need this information to be documented. So 1700 draw calls are being spent 
here in the opaque rendering section. So if we have a look at these draw calls, you will see the reasons that Unity has in order not to patch it, okay? So we can just be going down and down and down. And it is quite easy to see that most of the times we have way too many draw calls because draw call patching is not working because objects are affected by different forward lights. Okay, so that is very interesting. If that is the case, let's continue our profiling phase. So it is complaining that we have too many forward lights. What are these lights? We can just type T uh, lights. And indeed we have quite many lights. And it should be no surprise to you. There are all, most of them real time. Is anyone surprised at why this is at 20 FPS? I am not. Sure, it looks fancy, sure it looks good, but if it runs at 20 FPS, I'm not going to care about it, okay? I'm just going to probably spend a few hours shaking in bed with fever and super pale. So anyway, what can we do about this? If it says that we have way too many lights, then the obvious thing we can do is to remove some lights, or at least to you know, bake them in a way that we don't have to do these calculations in real time. That's one option, okay? And by thinking about options, we already advanced to the plan stage, okay? So option number one, remove lights, okay? So one example could be to select these lights and disable this in play mode, okay? I'm just giving you an example. If we do this, you see that the number of patches drop to 400, and this is a really juicy improvement, okay? So that's one option. And most people, we just go for this option and call it a day. They would just do this optimization, go home and say, hey, I'm proud of what I have done, and done with this. If you do this, however, you will see a huge difference in quality, right? Just compare the visual difference here. It is pretty significant. So more options are, don't know, what do you think? Because we're in a presentation, I cannot uh, just wait 10 minutes for people, you know, to come up with questions. So what I'm going to do instead is to give you a few more options. Because remember, in the plan stage, what we want to do is always to think about three options. Otherwise, you risk going for the cheapest option that is usually not the best option for the players, okay? So second option would be to go to these lights and say something like baked, okay? Now, this is grayed out for some reasons that are not important, but nevertheless, I will show you. So basically, we need to go to the lighting tab then and enable the baked global illumination okay so again we can go to mode and go and say baked okay we don't want these lights to be calculated in real time however if we do this and then we bake the lighting let's select for now uh, something like uh, subtractive and then generate lighting Okay, so this is done. I, by the way, reduced the light map resolution to four texts per unit just to iterate faster. So this is not the final result, but don't worry about it. Let's see what happens if I play now. Okay, so 400 batches. That's amazing. That's what we wanted for, at least in the first P3 optimization loop. However, you know, this still looks better than first option, which is just to remove the lights. However, we lose quite some, you know, UC effects. Like for example, the flickering of the light is gone. Okay, so, you know, this is still a better option. So you could totally go for this. Of course, you need to tweak a bit how the scene looks like, right? You need maybe to adjust the static flags and uh, change the light map resolution and all of the settings so that it looks good. And you know, this could be one option. However, we said that we want to at least consider three options. So 
Just think about that. What other options do we have? Now, if you have some experience in uh, game performance optimization, you will instantly recognize something here. If you go through the scene and disable the gizmos, of course, you'll see that this looks quite an indoors scene, doesn't it? And what techniques can we apply when we are in indoors scene and we want to reduce the number of trocos that we have? Hmm, how cute is this guy? Let me tell you that. Occlusion calling. Occlusion calling is all about not rendering what is being covered by other objects. So if we have a wall here, then no need to render this stuff. Okay, so that will be option three. Let's just give it a try, okay? We are just doing super fast testing here. We don't care about the perfect solution, like you can see on the left, right? I mean, this doesn't look perfect to me, although it looks uh, fine enough, okay? So what we are going to do here is to undo our optimizations. So we are going to our lights because control set is not working. Surprise. And uh, actually it worked. My mistake. All right. And uh, then we are going to go for option C, which is to bake occlusion cooling. How do we do that? Window rendering occlusion cooling. And then uh, let's just change the parameters to something that makes more sense. No worry about these parameters. And bake. All right. So now that we baked occlusion cooling, Everything disappeared. What happened here? No worries. We are in the visualization mode of occlusion calling. So that means that for this camera that we see here, we're going to see what we render and what we don't render. We can disable that visualization by just switching to another tab like Bake. So I would say that we are already making some substantial gains. Okay, so basically now if I hit play, we were at 2000 patches and now we are at 79. Hmm, very interesting. However, the lights are still not flickering. So something might have gone wrong. Let me check. I know what went wrong. I just forgot to clear the back data. But boy, Ruben, let's play it again. All right, so let's see the stats. 200 patches. All right, this is still quite good. It is quite similar to what we had before by re removing the real-time lights and even by converting the real-time lights to baked lighting. And this looks much better. We're talking about this room, of course. If we go to another room, of course, we will need to do some other types of opt optimization, okay? But step by step, we don't want to optimize everything at once. We want to do small steps that lead to small P3 optimization loops that lead to big gains. So now that we have played with three options, we could ask ourselves, is this actually what we need for a performance jump? You know, we might not have K we might not have come up with the perfect parameters here, but that's fine. What we can do is just to deploy a build and see the difference. So let's just press Control B and be right back. All right, so apparently I have found a way to stream this screen, including OVR metrics, without putting the headset on the webcam. I think this is a better alternative. Now, 72 FPS when I'm looking at the wall. I wonder what's going to happen once I turn around. I'm still going to keep my eyes closed just in case, all right? So, ready? Let's go. Whoop. Okay, don't move. All right. That's it. I saw the number. I think I saw a 40. Okay, that was maybe a bit too optimistic. I think I saw a 38. All right, so we went from, let's say 20 FPS to 38 FPS just by doing this. I wonder 
what would be the result if we did it correctly. So what you have discovered right now in the plan phase after some investigation is that you have three alternatives. One of them is really detrimental to the player. That would be the first one, which is all about removing the lights that are not the main one, the main directional one. That's no good, even though for me as a developer is quite convenient to do, right? But I care about people and I wouldn't do that. Second option is to make them static. But there, if we do that, then we will miss out on the flickering effects, okay? Option three, activate occlusion calling and call it a day. So, you know, those picking parameters might not be the perfect ones, but they are a good start. From all of these three options, I would say that my favorite one is by far picking occlusion colon. This could be a good P3 optimization loop. Now it will be the time to go to the perform stage, which is the last step of the P3 optimization loop. Here, we will just need to come up with the right picking parameters for the occlusion colon, okay? This will be the time to do it right, okay? Then once you're done, then you submit to Perforce, Git, Tortoise, SVM, whatever it is, and then there you can call it a day. That will give you a jump of, you know, about 20 FPS. If you want to calculate that in milliseconds, then just do the math. Of course, in milliseconds, it's a better uh, metric, right? And uh, since we would still not be reaching 72 FPS, then you would need to execute more P3 optimization loops, okay? Of course, there might be more options than the three options that we have seen. Feel free to explore them in different iterations. But honestly, if you manage to go from 20 to 40 FPS in just one iteration, I myself would be super happy about it. And now you just need to iterate over this P3 optimization loop until you reach your performance goal. What's your performance goal is a question, okay? It could be 72 FPS if you're talking to Quest, but it could also be 120 FPS if you're targeting Quest. Because as you know, Oculus just rolled out the 120 FPS upgrade. So now performance optimization, especially in the area of rendering, becomes more important than ever. Can you imagine how well your application or game will just sell if you manage to promote the message that your application supports 120 FPS and Hertz? That would be a nice, unique selling proposition, I would say. And you know, reaching 120 FPS is complicated. But if you have a structure, if you have a framework like the PC optimization framework, you can just do that. You just need to follow a series of steps that will lead you from zero to 120 FPS. And that is the power of having a proven framework. All right, I hope this was useful to you. And now is the time for you to shoot questions. And you know, I might not know all of them, but I will try my best to answer each of your questions. Let's go. Okay, shoot. Okay, great. So um, we already have a few questions piled up during the, during the recording. So thank you for everyone's patience. Uh, I hope that uh, it was giving enough idea in terms of hands-on part of it. But uh, anything, uh, Ruben, uh, you would like to share um, on top of the the, the hands-on part uh, before we, we we move to questions? We cannot hear you. Huh, now it's perfect. I'm really struggling to keep up with the questions. <laughs> yeah, there are a lot of questions. That's, that's good. That's good. Yeah, that's good. Let's let's do one by one. Um, we can also take questions from the uh, round table as well. Uh, we have uh, some of our alumni and students here as well. So um, yeah, let's start. So without further ado. So should I, should I read the question? Would it be better for you? I can read the question if you want. So does using Oculus integration package 
aka OVR, get you better performance on Oculus devices than Unity's XR Interaction Toolkit? I don't have uh, an answer to that. I haven't run any benchmark and it wouldn't be great from my side to give my opinion, uh, you know. I would need some numbers. And okay. some experiments for I mean, uh, anyone, anyone here who have an idea or anything to add to this question? I have. Well, I, I don't. I don't think that it will give you uh, any performance difference uh, just by adding the OVR uh, package. Um, but I think that there are a few API calls to the Oculus uh, plugin you can do, like setting the CPU and GPU levels, um, foveation, etc which can then help you a bit with your performance. But as Ruben said, there's, I, I, I never uh, made a, uh, I don't know, side by side of those things with and without OVR. I don't think there is a difference, but uh, that's something which uh, should be tested, of course, like everything in optimization. Okay, great. So next question, is there a keyboard shortcut for disabling a selected game object in Unity? <laughs> yes, it's a pretty convenient one. I guess by disabling, you mean deactivating. Um, you activate or deactivate game objects, and then you enable or disable the components of the game objects. In any case, to deactivate one object or one game object, you have to press, actually, I forgot. I think it's Control, sorry, Alt, Shift, A. I think that's it. So you press Shift, Alt, A. If someone can have a look and confirm it. Yeah, that's, it's that's... one of these things that I know how to type, but then if I need to recall it, I... <laughs> exactly. Muscle memory. This is called muscle yeah. memory. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. So Enzo Barles asks, you let the standard setting for the building of the light. Probably he was meaning towards the end of the of your um, uh, hands-on presentation. Yes, I. Yes, you know, I just took a project that is not thought for VR, which is pretty common in the industry that you are given a project that is not thought for VR or not thought for Quest. And here are the default settings, optimize it. So that's why I left it with the standard settings. Perfect. Uh, Jake asks, what is the best file format aspect ratio and compression for importing playing videos inside of Unity? Ihan, an idea. <laughs> or you, Ferhan? Well, that's, that <laughs> that's also something I always have to uh, check before I do something like that. This is exactly a topic for that. So I cannot really answer that right away. Uh, it's like all the um, settings for um, texture imports, like the ASTC uh, settings, which is perfectly suited for VR and mobile devices. Um, there is definitely a good way of importing uh, videos as well, but I cannot answer that. Well, my guess is that, you know, Quest supports, I mean, Quest has a very modern chipset, so it should support X265, which is pretty efficient. And it's, uh, it supports, you know, Quest should be able to support hardware encoding and, ha well, at least the coding of this uh, codec. But, Unity should also support that. And that's the, you know, I don't know there. Okay. Uh, I think Diego has one question. Let's uh, take question from the floor here. Hi, can you guys hey, hear me? Hey, Diego. How are you? Diego is uh, one of our uh, alumni of uh, our master classes, uh, advanced VR interaction master classes. Uh, so, Stage is yours, Diego, please. Yep, thank you very much. Um, so uh, thanks so much for doing this, big fan. Um, I was wondering, during our optimization passes, uh, we found out that our user interface had a ton and a ton of draw calls, right? Um, our initial assessment of it was like, well, we designed it that way because we were using a lot of the same assets, uh, but those assets generate a draw call, every single one, right? Uh, so uh, we trying to think of an approach like, should we prioritize draw calls or should we prioritize app size, right? Um, because one of the things that we think is like, okay, we can, uh, all of the non-dynamic assets put them in a single texture and have that texture in the UI, right? But that of course increases our uh, app size because it's yet another texture on top of it. That is a higher resolution. 
Um, I don't know. Do you think we should either prioritize your calls or app size? Is basically my question. Yeah. So I have a huge post on my blog about UI, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, let me see. It depends on where your bottlenecks are. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if you're targeting quests, you know you are very much constrained on draw calls that you can have. Mm -hmm. So I would not normally for quests, what I do is to have a combination of uh, using Sprite Atlases, the new one, not the old one, the mm -hmm. Sprite Atlas API. And I also tend to do something that upsets artists quite a lot and uh, UI designers, which is to mess with the uh, UI hierarchy, okay? The hierarchy, you know because it, there is a special way of organizing your hierarchy that facilitates unity uh, with its job of patching the draw calls. For example, if you have a button that has a graphic and then the text, and then uh, this, the next one, right? The graphic and the text, the graphic and the text, it is better to put, for example, all the graphics together at the beginning and then all the text at the end. It is a hell for an artist to make a UI like this that Unity will be able to patch these things very easily, right? So yeah, UI is a huge topic. So, mm -hmm. and make sure, of course, I, I guess you have done that already, but there is also these UI profilers on, I think it's, yeah, you could just go to the Unity profiler and you have a UI module and a UI detail module. module. So those are, can, can also be useful. Okay, awesome. Okay. I'll definitely be checking that uh, blog post as well. Thank you very much. I already posted uh, Game Dev Guru uh, UI blog post uh, link, so you can check there. There are actually multiple um, blogs. It's there. the second one, yeah. Second one, okay. So uh, let's continue because we are uh, our questions are piling up. How can I reduce from 1,200 batches? What should I check first? Lights, camera, action. <laughs> the friend debugger, the friend debugger, the friend debugger will tell you the truth normally. I hesitated to say the truth. Sometimes it lies, but normally the friend debugger tells you the reasons that it cannot patch your draw calls. Okay. Uh, David asks: Is the performance upgrade applies to both Quest One and Quest Two? I mean, general, I think it's a generic question, right? All the optimization. Yeah, I'm not so, sorry. I'm not sure I understand the question. Is it performance? I think, is it deployable to Quest 1 and Quest 2? Whatever you do on Unity, is it deployable to Quest 1 and Quest 2? That's the question, as far as I understand. But yeah, yeah I would. Uh, sorry, I have. Go ahead. No, no. I would say so. Yeah, but yeah, I'm not so sure I understand totally yeah. accurate the question. If the question Maybe is that, yes. If you I can. think the question was the, uh, the the same optimization we do for one platform yeah. if it applies for both, right? Uh, I, I understood it like that. So the answer would be like Ruben said, it's yes, yeah. Okay, great. Uh, is this an example of porting a previously PC-based game to standalone hardware or is the standard development procedure to create a scene? How do you want it to look ideally and then nerf it to fit the hardware? It depends on your industry, right? It is very common that you're just given a project that was developed some time ago and they say something like, hey, let's deploy it to Quest. Uh, it's your task, here it is. And then you deploy it and it's like 10 FPS. And this was the case for this project, right? And your job as a programmer or developer is to lead a team that you know uh, makes it possible to reach the target frame rate. Of course, it's not always about performance. You might need to do some usability changes uh, to comply with the Oculus TRCs, the technical requirements. But yeah, in my, in my experience, it's more common that you need to port already existing titles from other uh, platforms onto Quest. Okay. How could I make occlusion calling for more than one camera? For example, if I have an upper camera making a view like a minimap. Okay, I don't know for sure. However, having more than one camera, I know it's quite complicated on Quest. So if you have to do that, then... Uh, hmm. 
you know, I will be very careful with having more than one camera. I have done that on Quest and you pay a huge price. Just for example, uh, just adding one camera, even if it's rendering like one cube or something, that could well add uh, an overhead of, let's say, one millisecond, just because of the render pipeline. So yes, be careful with that. Um, to, and not to answer your question, I don't really know on top of my head how to do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, if we bake some lights, do they need to stay in the scene or can they be disabled? I believe they can be disabled. Okay. By the way, uh, we have a, a Sebastian come up, bring some perspective for the previous question. Generate the minimap image via code and not with a second camera might help. So it's probably for real time game or real time strategy game or something like that. Yeah. Or uh, yeah, any game that needs minimap. Maybe you can also just, just brainstorming a bit. Maybe you can just take like a screenshot or something from the top, right? Just pre-render this thing and then put it as a UI component and then I use the stencil buffer, you know, to cut the contour of the minimap. And then if you need to add some enemy markers or something, then just put it, uh, you know, on top. I don't know, just brainstorming a bit. Um, okay, so did we use uh, dynamic lighting in the third step or was it baked light? Plus, it was all dynamic, all dynamic, uh, tons of lights. So mm -hmm. I think the maximum that by default is in Unity is four in the settings. So I think up to four lights were used for this. So yeah, we were at 200 or something like this, 200 draw calls with all of these dynamic lights uh, in real time. Uh, by the way, uh, we had one more uh, open lecture, I think, one month ago, uh, with um, with uh, with a team who behind Green Hell VR and Blair Witch that they ported to to uh, Quest, and they also uh, shared a, a few interesting uh, like uh, procedures for that, especially on the lighting side. Uh, you can find that on our YouTube channel. So let's continue. How about imposters? Work fine in VR. I think imposters are a great technique. And every time I try to use them in VR, I didn't really put a lot of energy or focus on them. Uh, the packages were not really supporting that. I still tried that. And it was very weird, a very weird effect that I only saw it with one eye or it was flickering. It made me super dizzy in just within five seconds. And uh, I said, eh, it's it's not really required. But itself, like the, in the technique itself, it's uh, it's great. It has its use cases like for distant mountains and such. So I could see a lot of potential using imposters. Perfect. Which unity input system is better for Quest, new or old? I mean, uh, is it for optimization purposes? What do you mean by better? Or is it for interaction, fidelity, and uh, precision purposes? I don't know. Maybe for the interaction part, Ihan, you can answer. For the optimization, Ruben, you can answer. Is it the same answer? We don't know. Uh, <clears throat> to be honest, if you if you are um, creating custom interactions uh, for for the quest, for example, if you use uh, hand tracking or stuff, then uh, at least me personally, I'm not relying uh, uh, at, uh, on, on the uh, input system of Unity. I'm uh, doing it myself. It's more custom, like uh, we learned in the viral course, for example, um, from Roger and Dennis. So um, is there a better or... Uh, so you, I don't think you can really say it's better. Uh, it's, it depends on your uh, use case. So. You can try it out. If it uh, suits your needs, then stick to it. If not, then not. So one question is reactive programming from like uh, optimization perspective, does it help UniRx? Um, yes, uh, it's, it's yeah. Uh, so there are a few factors which are uh, better in, in uh, reactive programming, uh, especially when you use UniRx. Um, um, which is a reactive uh, framework. Um, for example, the update loop, um, 
the, the uh, default update loop of Unity uses a reflection to call uh, updates. And uh, the every update of UniRx, for example, the reactive framework, uh, it uses uh, so-called uh, micro coroutines, which uh, should, um, should uh, work better in, in comparison. Um, sometimes if you are profiling them in the editor, then you see that UniRx is performing worse, but you should always profile such things not in the editor, but uh, in a build. So uh, if, you, if you still see that in, in, a, in a full fledged build, the performance is worse, then stick to the normal Unity uh, update loop. But uh, we are, you, we, in our company, we are using UniRx, for example, as well, uh, for exactly that reason. And on top of that, if you have no real bottleneck uh, regarding that, then it adds, it gives you a lot of um, easy functions to use. Like um, you can create update loops from everywhere for every object, uh, very easy. And you can, yeah, you can use reactive programming. So it's it's uh, once you have learned that uh, concept, it's really great to have that, especially in interaction design for hand tracking, for example. It's very easy to create um, get gestures for for hands and fingers in in a short amount of time. Yeah, uh, Druban, uh, your point, like from an optimization perspective. Um, haven't tested that. I cannot resign. Okay. Okay. By the way, uh, Tiago is with us. Uh, he is from our current cohort. This week is the reactive programming week for them. So I hope that he will also uh, give some insights in the upcoming maybe weeks. So let me continue the questions because we have a few more questions. So what um, what is your advice for a project that deals with a lot of foliage, like a forest, for example? Yeah, uh, probably GPU instancing because I guess you tend to reuse the same mesh all and all the time. So maybe GPU instancing with a custom shader, I think you can make it look pretty nice. But it depends on the density as well, right? Okay, um, Kitty is asking, is your URP good for Quest? Well, there's your answer. <laughs> I would say so. It was not good back in the days, like really bad. I did some performance comparisons, but I guess this is now much better and uh, it can only get better. But yeah, who knows? Right now is a good uh, alternative. Unreal uh, is asking, is it possible and convenient to change the rendering scale in Oculus as in SteamYard to get more frames per second? Yes, in fact, uh, I have done that and shipped a few projects like that, but it is not great. That's like a last, uh, you know, you don't really want that. It depends on your use case, but for example, it is something that you will notice very easily when you are reading text. If you reduce the resolution, even just 5%, you will see that the text is more pixelated. The 3D itself, you know, it might be harder to notice, but yeah, it depends on your use case. Try to avoid that. But however, what I have to say about that is that it's an excellent way of trying to find your uh, performance bottleneck, right? If you just reduce the render scale and you see that you are still performing bad, then chances are pretty high that your bottleneck is on the CPU. So I think that's the best use that I have for the render scale. Perfect. So Tony is asking, how much does the impact of real-time lights on performance change if shadows are disabled for the light? Still quite substantial. Um, I mean, real-time shadows are normally not very well accepted on Quest. So people will tell you normally to avoid using real-time shadows. They can cost you like a baseline of two milliseconds or something like this. They can easily double your number of draw calls sometimes. And just imagine, I just said two milliseconds. If you're targeting 120 FPS, you have, it's my cat. <laughs> you have about uh, 80 milliseconds to do everything. So two milliseconds is just way too much. Okay. 
Uh, Andres is asking, do you know if there's any way of getting accurate specular reflections in URP for Quest? Just using reflection probes doesn't allow probe blending, so any reflection becomes inaccurate on big objects. I need to think about that. Um, maybe Ihan? Yeah, well, uh, just recently I made uh, created a small project to test uh, something with reflection. And I think the best way and the most performant way I found was to fake these reflections in, in for example, when you uh, have experience with Photoshop doing something like a re reflection in Photoshop is you are duplicating the object, you are uh, turning it upside down, uh, putting some layer over, uh, over it like a gradient and then that's your reflection, right? And you can fake something like that in URP pretty easy. Uh, there was a, just recently, Farhan, you saw that as well, the, the post from the Beat Saber makers yeah. who had a reflection on most of the people were asking like, oh, is this real-time reflection? No, it was not. It's of course, and it's, it doesn't have to do anything with uh, rate, uh, um, um, rate tracing or so. It's just fake reflection. It's nothing else as uh, to put the same object uh, upside down. Of course, you have to do some math to, uh, to um, also uh, to, uh, t take into account the rotation of the object because uh, the original object turns maybe to the right on the x-axis. On the bottom, it then has to be reflected, right? You have to do some quaternion uh, math there. And uh, putting a transparent layer maybe over that, then you have perfect and crisp reflections. That's a great way to, to create a uh, reflection if that suits your uh, situation, of course. Not every reflection is on the plane on the bottom, but yeah, that's that's an idea. And uh, regarding the reflection probe uh, blending, you're right, um, it's, it's currently not supported, but uh, just recently uh, the Unity staff um, uh, mentioned in a post uh, after like two years or so that they are now uh, uh, finally are working on it to implement it in, I think, uh, Ruben, I told you it was 2021.1 alpha in an alpha version or so. So it's coming. Uh, it's, it's, it's on its way. Uh, hopefully 2020.2 or so maybe could be production ready. Uh, but don't take that uh, into <laughs> like uh, it can be. I, I think it will come uh, this year, hopefully. <laughs> Perfect. So uh, let me continue. Philip is asking, how do you keep skyboxes looking nice when they are usually 4K or higher HDR images? I think it's totally fine to have 4K textures. Like Quest is doesn't even sweat, right? To try to, to be uh, rendering stuff with 4K textures. Of course, uh, there's a limit. So if you reach it, then you might need to turn it down. But uh, just keep an eye on the memory and the memory bandwidth that you're using on Quest. And uh, I guess that you will be fine. Daniel is asking, how fast can we draw an empty scene? And why does the sky generate a draw call? We would ideally like to clear the clear to skybox rather than clear frame buffer to a color, then draw skybox. I saw I say this because in the latter example, every pixel is getting set twice. Does it make sense? Yeah, I mean I had problems with uh, draw, with drawing the skyboxes in the past, especially because I think Unity was rendering them first or something like this. And back then it made no sense because this is actually the last thing you, you see in terms of overdraw. It was just generating a lot of overdraw. So I think what they ended up doing was just to create my custom material. And I told it to be one of the last things that I rendered after the opaque objects. That way, if I am outside, right, in the, you know, in my courtyard or something, and I'm looking at the sky, but I have a button in front of me then you just don't draw the pixels that uh, belong to this uh, bottle, right? So sometimes the answer might be just, you know, to create your own material for the skyboxes. And that's, uh, you know, it's not uh, incredibly complex. Narek is asking, do you need to have a debug build in order to view the Unity profile and profiler? And if so, how much does that affect performance? Yeah, so what you need to do is to have a development build. 
So basically, when you go to build settings or control shift B, then you have to tick the, you know, the development build. That's the only thing you need to do. Uh, then the debug, release, master mode is something different. And those actually affect a lot the, the game performance or your application performance. OK. Uh, occlusion calling requires to bake in the editor. What could be used for procedural games to target the same goal, which is calling of non-visible objects, since the components of the map wouldn't be available before the runtime? Yes, I got this question once, like last week. I don't have an answer to that yet, because there is a reason that mm -hmm. these things are baked. This is just pretty harsh on the CPU. But I'm sure that, you know, I have seen packages in the store that lets you do the calling on the GPU through compute shaders. I have no idea how well that works. You can try that. If you try that and uh, have some success, let me know. I'm super interested in that. But this is, of course, one topic that I have in my, under my radar. I'm personally very interested in that. So we have actually rendering optimization uh, channel in the Discord server. So it's actually a nice point that we can also uh, share our um, takeaways if we try. Ihan, would you like to say something about that part? Uh, no, like Ruben said, I know there are a few assets who attempt to to solve this problem. Um, I was I was thinking of the uh, of an API, but that's also just for baked uh, uh, maps. So okay, just just check those assets. I would say. Amshu is asking: Does rect transforms and regular transforms affect performances? Uh, as an example, does it matter if there are three D objects in a uh, UI hierarchy? Yes, it does quite a lot, actually. And surprise, I have a blog post. Actually, I have two blog posts about it. Okay, I will just link it soon. Basically, the the more important thing is that you don't want to nest the um, game objects uh, very deeply in the hierarchy because that's going to affect how well Unity can do the transform updates in parallel. This is especially relevant for dynamic or moving objects. So every time that you change a transform, then you trigger a cascade of changes all along the transforms. That's why ideally you should keep as many objects as you can in the root of your scene, if that makes sense. I will post soon the, the first post. Perfect. Uh, Manuel is asking, my default Oculus VR player game object has three cameras in it that I can't delete. Two of them are disabled. I have four times the batches in VR than I have in non-VR. Have you experienced that and how can I solve it? Try multi-view. I'm sure that <laughs> by the way you're describing that, you might be using multi-pass instead of multi-view. So you need to go to the project settings, then go to the XR plugin management, Oculus, I forgot, blah, blah, blah. Then in the Android section, you will see the, the rendering mode. Just make sure that you are using multi-view. This should help a lot with the draw calls. And you might still have a lot of, of things to, to do after that, but that's uh, one of the things that you can just click and you know solve half of the problems. Perfect. Uh, Daniel is asking high, oh. highly theoretical question. Do you anticipate an app that runs natively at 60 hertz, but, but it is time warped to 120 hertz will feel more responsive than an app which merely runs at 60 hertz natively? Let's assume that the former app utilizes phase sync to minimize lat latency and that both are equally stable, taking 15 frames, uh, 15 milliseconds to render a frame. I was actually thinking uh, along these lines a few days ago about that. And I guess they can do that. I mean, I remember the first time my mother bought one of these new TVs that they did this kind of interpolation. They have like two frames and then they just make up a, an intermediate frame. You know, if you're just playing a movie at 60, sorry, 24 FPS, but your, uh, your monitor supports 60, then you can just make up some frames in between. I think they could do that. However, I don't know if that will be the case, right? Uh, I guess that we need more details from Oculus. And in any case, it's not going to feel as good as if you do this natively, of course. Ivan is asking, what do you think about Unreal Engine for XR? Uh, I think this is a very uh, long answer. I mean, we may need maybe one more hour. 
So, uh, but let's even let's discuss this in uh, in our Discord server. Um, Daniel is asking as, as an uh, an architectural question. In simple terms, perhaps talking about draw call setup, can you contrast the the costly nature of OpenGL draw calls to Vulkan draw calls, and roughly when do you anticipate Vulkan becoming better than op OpenGL on Quest? It's hard yep. to predict so, the future. Sorry. Um... Vulkan, if it works, use Vulkan. It will only be better. The driver has much less overhead, and especially if you're talking about draw calls, that's going to be much cheaper, okay? So maybe you can be looking for a 20% gain in terms of uh, draw call handling, and that that's great. I mean, 20%, if you have a budget of eight milliseconds, that's, that's pure gold. Yeah. Perfect. If you need to dynamically change content scale, what is the most performant way to do that? Content scale, like the game object game object scale, or or the render scale, content scale. Well, I guess the answer is always dots. <laughs> Exactly. What, what is it? Yeah. Then uh, yeah, uh, there is actually a few more discussions about uh, the how to bring the PC VR games to Quest. I think uh, these kind of questions, if you have really hundreds of objects components in a scene, uh, I think uh, Dots uh, Workshop will be the perfect place to ask these questions on sixth of May. Uh, Boris is asking, is there a way to emulate or preview the graphic look of a quest in a PC? Mobile and desktop graphics have different capabilities and sometimes I use post-processing effects, shaders or textures that works well on PC, but appears broken in quest. I love this question. So <laughs> here's the thing. There is a sneaky trick you can do in Unity, which is to go to the player settings when you are while you are targeting quest of course and then go to the windows or standalone uh, tab on the player settings and then switch off the auto api i'm calling recalling that from memory okay so might be a bit vague and then you can remove DirectX and add opengls 3 instead and put it on top unity will ask if you want to restart the editor say yes and then suddenly you have a, a Unity editor running on OpenGL S instead of on DirectX. And that's going to be much closer to Quest. There might be some instabilities in the Unity editor, but uh, in general, it's pretty manageable. Without even wearing a headset, right? Uh, yeah, well, it, it, let's say it's closer. Let's, yeah, let, okay. let's not say this. <laughs> Okay, URP performance maybe, question. What, what's maybe yeah. interesting is uh, sometimes there are, um, I don't know, sh shader um, um, executions which are not supported on uh, Quest 1 hardware, for example. I'll just, a few hours ago, I just uh, saw that in, in, in my logs. So there are sometimes things which are just not supported by the GPU. And even when you are setting to OpenGL as uh, three or two on in the editor, it still uses your native GPU, right? So it may work in the editor, but when you are then deploying it to your quest, it uh, spits out some errors. So uh, you always have to lock uh, the lockhead from ADB uh, from from uh, the quest as well to see if it really works or not. Daniel is asking URP performance question. Did you notice a performance degradation of the URP on Quest in Unity? 2020.2.0 F1 and beyond. I mean, if anything, I would expect a performance improvement, but I haven't heard of that. But I wouldn't be surprised either. I mean, so in, we've terms, seen this of, in, in terms of so not maybe visual perf uh, the, the performance regarding the GPU, but um, I know from Dennis, for example, that in 2020.3, uh, the physics system, because they changed the way uh, uh, they calculate the delta time, um, the physics system is uh, somehow a bit broken uh, and uh, works at jittery. And uh, the performance is then as well uh, 
not that good. So it could be that it, uh, um, that there is a degradation, like you said, in, in performance. Uh, but yeah, that's again something you have to test yourself. Uh, if you use a lot of physics, maybe it's better for you to stick to 2020.1 or even 2019 LTS version. One more question. Which version of the unit engine is your current default for Quest development and why? I think relevant, maybe. I yeah, mean, I always use right? the latest so... LTS, LTS. Yeah. And sometimes if I feel uh, adventurous, I go even for an experimental or something. If I know that by the time I'm going to release it, it's going to be fine. Uh, Daniel is asking HDR and light map question. ASTC compression isn't great for RGB modulated formats like night light maps or HDR skies, but ARM has solved this with Unity by feeding different values to the compressor. Are you aware of a way to get the compressor to work well with Unity light maps like ARM did? I'm not aware of that. I would probably maybe even tweet to ARM about that. They are sometimes quite responsive and check on the Unity forums. That's what I would do myself if I was not able to find a solution. OK. Uh, Ege is asking, I have a project that I want to upload the model created by the users to the stage. When I load the export scale, which is taken while creating the model to the stage at runtime, it causes trouble. trouble. Can I control the global scale of the model at runtime? It's your turn, Ihan. I will leave to the difficult so questions. I, I'm not sure if I understood it correctly, but uh, in general, yes, you can uh, scale your model at runtime. Uh, of course, if it's a static object, then you should not do that. Um, but in general, if it's a dynamic object and you have imported it, then there's nothing uh, which stops you from scaling your objects up and down. Um, but I'm not sure, of, of course, if I understood it here correctly. Uh, you say you have a, a scale of an object which is exported from like Blender or Maya or something, and you're importing it, creating it, and uh, you want to, at runtime, at runtime it causes trouble. So I don't know what you mean here uh, by trouble. Maybe you can uh, elaborate on that in our Discord server, so um, we can check that later on. We can definitely bring this question on the Discord server. So Brennan is asking, any idea why my Quest app would be slightly darker than in the editor? So there are a few options here. One, your screen is broken. <laughs> That's the most unlikely one. The, it could also be the color space. So if you are using linear, try the other way around, use gamma. By the way, gamma is always a bit better when it comes to performance, but less accurate. So those are my two cents. Maybe I hung half more. Um, maybe the uh, in the texture settings, the sRGB uh, checkbox, uh, you have to uh, check if you have set them correctly. Uh, for example, for normal maps, etc., you should never check them because then your normal maps are not uh, displayed correctly. And as, as the same for specular or, I don't know, uh, ambient occlusion maps, sRGB should never be uh, checked on. Um, but that can cause darker scenes sometimes. That's something you, again, have to uh, test. As I say always, these things you have to side by side see for yourself because they are highly individual uh, issues. So uh, yeah, but um, other than that uh, uh, display mode, like Arun said, so linear or gamma. Daniel, give some uh, perspective. Maybe you can also check the chat window. Uh, Brennan. So uh, Juan Franco, our last question for Quest. Oculus integration versus XR toolkit, which one? So I'm, I'm, I'm always using the Oculus integration uh, toolkit uh, uh, currently. Um, that's just a personal. <laughs> uh, oh, really? I'm actually the opposite. Right? <laughs> Uh, I don't know. I, I I have the feeling that Unity is going to support, you know, the 
integrated one a bit better. And it's always a bit easier to set up the whole process. Yeah, and, you know, uh, to port a project to VR is also easier. It's just normally just one click, at least for yeah. the initial setup. But I have no idea in terms of performance. So. Okay, guys, uh, we oh. have answered 46 questions. Uh, so, um, so I hope that everyone enjoyed today. Um, so we, we will close in one minute. So actually we are on time. So that's great. But uh, if you want to, if you like what you are seeing right now, uh, we will continue the discussion uh, in uh, Discord. And uh, also on 3rd of May, uh, we have uh, the masterclass starting with uh, Ruben. If you want to have at least more hands-on for six weeks period with a, a very nice nightmares project at the end. And on 6th of May, uh, there'll be DOTS masterclass, sorry, uh, the DOTS workshop starting as well. So um, it's also free uh, for DOTS workshop. If you want to attend, you can also um, register on the Eventbrite page. So thank you again, Ruben, Ihan, everyone on the stage uh, for everyone who is asking questions. I think uh, these are smart questions and smart answers. So let's continue this discussion in the uh, upcoming weeks. Thank you, everyone. And have a very I'll see nice you day. all in the course. See you in the course. See you in the workshops. Bye. Ciao. All right.